There we go. Hello, everyone. For real this time. I pulled a, a Abner muted here. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is the recap stream for our learning jam, our first ever learning jam. Thank you for the reminder. Asaf was was going for the fade out. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll take it all back again. Hi, welcome to the recap show for the 2024 learning jam. Uh, this is a new kind of event that we were trying out this year within the handmade community. It's uh, a we've we've done other kinds of jams before, um, but the learning jam was instead of the, the instead of the goal being to produce some piece of software like a game or an app, our goal with this jam was to learn. We wanted to give people in the community an opportunity to dive deep into a topic that they've been meaning to look at for a long time, try and absorb as much information as they could, and then share that information with the rest of the community so that as a community of programmers, we are building up our own knowledge about these different topics. So it was a unique format. We did two weekends. First weekend was learn everything you can. Second weekend was, was share all that info with everyone. Um, and I think it went pretty well. We had a lot of submissions. If you go look at the Learning Jam page on the site, and uh, Asaf has shared the link in the chat, uh, you can see that we got, uh, I, didn't, I didn't count ahead of time, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 submissions to this thing, 18 people who started like to dive into a topic and, and learn what they could. And we're going to highlight a few of those on this show today. Uh, we are going to have four guests with us. Uh, we're just going to chat with them a bit about what they learned, what they thought of the process, you know, celebrate the the event and, and everything that they learned and where they're going with their knowledge in the future. So uh, what else did I want to say during my intro here? Uh, this stream's going to be pretty casual, uh, a little more low key than the, the streams that we've done before. If you'll notice, we don't have the fancy animated transitions between these things anymore because I didn't have time to remake them. It's a little bit more more casual. And this stream is happening on a holiday weekend. Uh, it is Easter weekend right now, and so uh, several people were not available. But it was the best time that we had to celebrate this, and so we're, we're going to make the most of it. So to get us started, we're going to chat with Anne. Anne is a relatively new member to the Handmade community. She has been really interested in Windows and learning how to program on Windows, learn you know lower level details of Windows. And she decided for this jam to dive deep into virtual memory and memory management on Windows. You can see her submission is memory management in Windows. I'm going to pull her into the Discord call here so that we can actually chat with Anne in person. So let me, give me a second to set this up. Uh, hello, Anne, can you hear me? Awesome, and I hope that the chat can hear you. We'll have to confirm. And let me switch over to the correct scene here. Oh no, Discord's doing the thing again. Thank you, Discord. There we go. Okay, can't hear you. Discord audio. One moment. Sorry, everyone. Um. Uh oh. <laughs> Why? No, that one's fine. Hold on. Hold on. How does any of this work? Hmm. Peculiar. Very peculiar. So I'm, that's weird, because I'm, I'm streaming this, and it should be capturing audio. The audio should hmm. be coming from there. Ooh. I can hear you. I wonder well, if that's good. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't really restart OBS anymore. Uh-oh. Well, here, let me, let me try restarting the window capture and stuff. I'll, I'll be back in this call in a second. We will pull this over here again. We will take the Discord screen capture again, please. All 
Oh no, that was the wrong one. <laughs> Everything is going crazy right now. So that's my scene. The Discord. Where even is the the Discord scene? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? And and can can chat confirm? Can you hear her? Oh my god! <laughs> How? What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? How could you hear her a second ago? I wasn't even done. <laughs> no. No. Um. All right. Here's what we're gonna do. Since I'm not playing any video, I have to add an audio source now. Or this is what we get when when I have to when when we don't run the full AV test. I changed nothing from when we ran this show before, and yet everything is broken. So I'm gonna add. Oh, audio output capture. And it's going to be, wait a minute, how do you capture desktop audio? <laughs> no, OBS, please, please OBS. Disaster. Disaster. Trying this again from a browser. Hello to the browser. Yeah, I haven't I haven't shared the window yet. So hopefully now when I cut back to Firefox recap live now, if you say something, maybe you'll come through. No guarantees. Just maybe. Now, is there anything or is it when I pop the window out that it doesn't work? <laughs> I feel like it's oh. Yes, fingers crossed. Oh, oh, my goodness. I It's literally the same setup that I started with. <laughs> it's literally exactly the same. Sorry for putting everybody through that. I can actually get started with the show now. This is how we're going to pad it out to an, an hour or two or whatever. So okay. there you go. My apologies. Thank you for for joining me today. Um, oh, is my gain low? I can I can gain myself up. How is that? Check one, two. Yeah. Yep. That should be in a little bit better range now. Check one, two. Yep. Somehow, somehow my gain had, had dropped on this thing. Okay. So, Anne, you did virtual memory and memory management in Windows for the Jan. Yes, I did. And uh, I'm curious, so what uh, is your programming background for the audience? And how did you get interested in virtual memory in the first place? Yeah, so my programming background is a little bit complicated. When I was a preteen, I started actually writing batch scripts. I got my first laptop and it was just off to the races, but I really didn't know where to start. So I kind of accidentally discovered, I think I was trying to make Windows do something and I ended up discovering batch and I just fell in love with it. So I wrote tons and tons of batch scripts. And then in college, I learned C Sharp. I learned a little bit of Java and C++ as well. But things in my life took a turn, and I ended up actually not graduating with uh, a degree in anything to do with programming. I kind of put that on the back burner. And then recently at my job, I had an opportunity to start writing. I wrote a lot of scripts, and I actually had an opportunity to start writing a bit of C Sharp again. And it reminded me how much I loved programming back in the day, and I decided to do something crazy, I decided that I was going to attempt to do what I had wanted to do since I was a little kid back then, actually learn Windows programming. So I've just barely started. I am not well versed in it at all. But one of my first projects, I copied some code off of MSDN and I thought, well, just copying the code isn't going to help me learn anything. I should try to figure out what this code is doing. And the code was calling a function called global alloc. And I decided to go see what global alloc was. 
And I learned that it was a way to allocate memory, but it was a way to allocate memory in a very specific way. It had to do with the 16-bit days and near and far memory and all sorts of things. And the better thing to call nowadays in most cases was called heap alloc. And then I kind of started to fall down a rabbit hole of, okay, well, well what is the heap? What is global? What is local? What, are, what do all these things mean? And it just so happened that HMN was hosting a learning jam around this time. And I thought, hey, that would be a great topic to cover for my jam. Let's try to get a better understanding of what's actually going on here. When I call into Windows and ask for some memory, what's what's it actually doing and how does that work? So that's what inspired my jam topic. Well, that's awesome. And you wrote a ton on this topic. I was <laughs> I was amazed by by the breadth of information covered here, especially because like this is a topic that I actually went through myself somewhat recently, and it's a lot. There's there's a ton of information there, and you covered a wide span of it in a really short amount of time. So it was it was really cool to see. Um, before we go Thank further, you. I do have to actually remark: it's really funny to me that your first programming language and the one that you sort of fell in love with was Batch of all things. I think for a yeah. lot of people, like that's for for me, it makes no sense to me. It it seems like a completely incoherent programming language, and to a lot of people, I think it it seems really confusing. But what was it about it that was you know so fun for you? Like what drew you to it? Um, like I said, I kind of fell into it by accident. I think I want to say I was trying to get my computer to hibernate with a desktop shortcut, and I looked into how to do that, and someone said, oh, you could write a batch file. And I was like, what's a batch file? I was I was a very curious uh, kid always. It's, it's gotten me into trouble. I have a reputation now at work for being the questions person who just inundates anyone who will let me talk to them with questions about what they're doing and so on and so forth. But I've always been very inquisitive, and I just got curious about what this batch thing was and you could run it and it would make the computer do stuff and I just thought that was really interesting and the nice thing about batch I know a lot of people you know it's it's certainly quite the arcane kind of thing and it has a lot of weird uh, idiosyncrasies but having no ex previous exposure to programming I actually found it pretty easy to pick up kind of because it's this very no pun intended very basic scripting language. And I, I just really enjoyed it. I found myself able to catch on and to start using things like variables and even, you know, logic with if and else. And then mm -hmm. I started learning um, more complicated things like go to. So it's really funny, actually, my first programming class in college, I we were working on something and I, I forget the exact details, but it was something where we were repeating some functionality and I had never touched um, a, a programming language beyond batch at that point. And we were repeating some functionality and I, I had the thought, oh, I could do this with a go to statement because I could go back to this you know thing that we need to do again. And so I raised my hand and I asked my professor, excuse me, how do you do a go to statement in C sharp? And bless his heart, he didn't you know go off on me or talk about how that isn't OOP or something like that. He actually he you know quite kindly explained that oh well we wouldn't do a go to statement we would make a method and so I learned about methods earlier in the course than well I'm sure people there already knew what methods were but I didn't so I learned about them very very early on so it's something that I don't I hardly ever use it I do occasionally now in my job but. I'm kind of glad that I started there in a way because it's it's got the fundamentals of programming without a lot of the additional complexity that comes in a, a language like C Sharp where you have sure. like bats, there's no types, there's no classes and, and all that stuff. It's it's very simple and very stripped down. But yeah, I actually, it was a total accident getting into Batch and actually getting into Windows as a whole. It was just something I got curious about and yeah. just kept pursuing. Well, I think the other thing that's nice about batch is that there's no setup required, really. You know, you don't need the, exactly. the IDE and you don't need the project and, and all that to get something working. So it makes sense that it would be something fun to fall into. As far as memory, so having gone through all this now, you you broke your submission down into several parts. So you you gave this overview of pages, what sizes they are, what it means to be demand paged the different states that pages can be in. Then you got into the page tables and virtual memory and how all that breaks down. What was something that surprised you like out of, out of everything you learned? I think one of the most surprising things to me was actually learning that a lot of 
memory is, I, I'm going to use the term shared. I don't mean shared in the, the Windows technical sense, but in the sense that a program running can have access to memory that other programs do. So for example, a DLL file is actually loaded into memory once and then multiple things access it. And parts of the operating system are mapped into memory once and then multiple things access it. And I guess virtual memory is something that I've always been vaguely familiar with. You know, you learn about, oh, you have a page file and you can expand, you know, beyond your you know, physical memory limit, you can have right. more than that of sorts in memory. And I knew that, but actually learning about how that allows operating systems to reuse specific sections of memory and the mechanisms around that was something that I found just really interesting. I'd, I'd never considered that before. And it was great to be able to peek under the hood and actually learn that, yeah, it's it's able to enable that reuse through virtual memory. It's more than just you know, having a page file, it's it's actually a whole entire yeah. mechanism unto itself. Yeah, well, and you also mentioned um, being, let's see, you, yes, it, it was right here in your submission. You were surprised and delighted by the way that the page table works with the virtual address being indices into these these page tables and the way that that whole system works to actually break down this massive virtual space into something that fits in in physical memory, um, which is just really yes, cool. I, yeah, I got a huge kick out of that. I, I don't exactly know why, but I just found it so fascinating that the virtual, you can w walk through these layers and layers of, of page tables just using the virtual address. There's no you know, there, there's nothing else needed. You have this one address and you can go through multiple you know, page tables of page tables of page tables to the actual address in, in memory where it resides. And I just thought that was the, the coolest thing ever. I'm, I'm not sure why, I guess being so new to all of this, um, it's beautiful to see the simplicity in such complex systems. It's beautiful to see yeah. what people are able to come up with to, to do things in a manner you would you would never think of where you just go, wow, that's that's genius. Yeah. I am curious how you feel about all the, the terminology, which I get very lost in when I'm looking at Windows because you've got the page directory pointer table. I had to write this down. <laughs> the page directory pointer table, the page <laughs> directory, the page table, all of these different things. There's the page file objects which like aren't necessarily backed by the page file. <laughs> yeah, it, it does get very, I guess it helps, in a way it almost helps for me because I, I'm not familiar with any other system. Windows is kind of the first system I've learned and the system that I'm learning. So it's not like I'm having to deal with two sets of terminology, but it, it is a lot. I won't lie. I, you know, sitting here and talking to you, I don't feel like I have... I wouldn't even say I have a good grasp on all of this. I, I have a basic grasp. I kind of can know my way around, but it's a lot. And I, you know, I think that's something that I actually, even though it does make it very challenging, it's something that I really love. I've always loved about Windows is it's it's this world unto itself. And I know growing up, it was, I would just escape into this world and get lost in hours and hours of, of MSDN articles and learning all of these obscure, you know, terminologies and, and ways of doing things. And I, it, it's certainly challenging, I'm not gonna lie, but in a way I just love it and I think it's great. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. I mean, it's been really fun seeing you come into the community as somebody who, clearly has not a ton of programming background, certainly not the same kind of programming background that a lot of people come in with, but you are just so excited to learn how Windows works. <laughs> and it is just really fun to see because like, <laughs> you know, it's, I feel like part of the handmade vibe, the handmade ethos is just that curiosity about how systems work, that you don't necessarily need a ton of motivation, a ton of career reason to to learn these systems. It's just interesting. and when you learn how to do stuff with them, it's just fun. <laughs> so it's been fun seeing you throw yourself at what I think many would consider to be a pretty low level, pretty serious kind of topic that a lot of people would be like kind of afraid to dig into or, or you know, that's not really necessary. We've got malloc, we've got whatever else. Um, yeah, but you know, I see you've got you've, you've got the uh, the what is that? Is that the proc, proc exp? all the Windows internals tools and everything where you're breaking down all the different yeah, memory that's, metrics. That's I, got, Explorer. I got yep. very, very <laughs> familiar with that. 
um, because of some of oh, my yeah. work last year <laughs> trying to correlate what all the different memory metrics mean. And it's it was really interesting. It, you you might have to if you didn't play with um, the what is it performance monitor on Windows that can actually show you graphs of like the sizes of all the different page lists and that kind of thing. So when you allocate memory, you can see the zero page list go down in size and other lists go up in size and you can like see those transitions happen, which is actually really, really fun to see. Yeah, there's some really cool tools out there. I didn't get to mess around with things as, as much as I wanted to. Um, of course, I will in the future, but there's really cool stuff like the VM map that um, I saw in Mark Rosinovich's talk, oh, and yeah. I went in there and looked at it. And it's so cool just to see everything like, wow, this is actually where things are and like how this works. And again, peek under the hood. It's It's really cool. Yeah. Well, do you have any idea where you're going to take this knowledge in the future or any other topics in Windows that are on your bucket list? Kind of all of it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Being so new, there's it, it's like the the whole world is is open to me, you know. I'm not really sure where to where to start. I mean, it's something I'm going to continue learning about and I hope to get some more actual coding under my belt now that I've spent some some time in theory I hope to do more actual programming and continue on that of course that's a lot more challenging than just reading articles but it's something I really want to do so I've got some projects in mind and I'm just so excited to be a part of this community and have all these wonderful people encouraging me and it's it's just been great and it's been such a such a boost to my you know, getting back into programming after years of being away from it. So very excited for the future and happy to be a part of this community. Thank you so much for joining us for the jam, making it worth all the effort of organizing. Uh, I think we're going to kick over to Lugan now. Actually, I did not ask how I should how I should address him in this conversation. But, um, let's see. Uh, let me pull. He is Lugan on the Discord. Andreas in real life, uh, which would you prefer I call you here? Oh, do we have audio? Is audio working? Hey, yes, there you go. Hello, are. do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Cool. Yeah, you can see me as well. Yep. Cool. Well, hello, welcome. Uh, uh, yeah, I... it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's Lugan. Lugan. Okay, cool. Short you. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us here. So you did your presentation or your your topic was uh, BRDFs, and that might be a subject that others in the community aren't familiar with. So could you quick like give a, a definition of that? Uh, yeah, it was uh, a subject I wasn't too familiar with as well, uh, but I'm into uh, I'm into graphics programming. And I've heard the term before, or a similar uh, abbreviations, and uh, and um, I've been mostly doing like geometry-related uh, graphic stuff, and and uh, I, and the lighting has been on the bucket list. So and and uh, it came to mind. So I thought, yeah, my sh should uh, uh, check out what that's about. Should probably be simple. Sounds small. Well, how turns did it out, pan out uh, once you actually started digging into it? <clears throat> well, well, it turned out that that BRDF is um, is just a, a, an abstract concept. It's a, it's a name of a type of function that you use in the like shading or lighting equation when you're dealing with the uh, light that's interacting with uh, material. Uh, so things, so there wasn't much to it. So things escalated into actually uh, studying um, uh, physically based uh, shading instead. Okay, sure. that's where it's being used extensively. Yeah, because you mentioned in one of your jam updates as you were learning that other shading models like Lambert and Fong shading also actually count as BRDFs, which which I didn't realize. So, what are the actual properties of a, a BRDF? Like, what what does it take to be a BRDF? It simply re returns the like it returns the reflected light of the of the surface. 
that's all it does essentially it it's described in different ways and it can also be interpreted in in a couple of ways but essentially that's what it does so like if you look at the the rendering equation huh? should i look at a particular have, page uh, of, of oh right here i see uh no further down oh. uh, yes there you have it um, oh so like yeah and that's uh, that's uh, roughly the the equation that's or that that describes the pipeline that's how how shading is constructed in in most algorithms that you have like your uh, your um, your brdf and it's and it's multiplied with the incoming light i see and then it's multiplied with the classic um, lambertian factor that uh, that uh, people have done any basic lighting might be familiar with where your dot product uh, incoming light with the normal uh, Right, so and that, that's, that's, what you were, general... that's what you were showing in the diagram above, right? Where you have a vector toward the light, you have a vector toward the view, you've got your half vector, all these other things that, that typically go into the calculation. But a, So a BRDF yes. is essentially just a, a function of these input vectors that returns some, some color, some amount of light? Yeah, yeah in sure. rendering it's, it's usually RGB. Because it can be a spectral or just it can be a wavelength, depending on your application. Sure. So, so and that's probably how it was uh, was formulated in the beginning. Because I think all of this originates in optics. Mm. So this is like very very old concepts. I think uh, Wikipedia stated that the first BRDF was like formulated in the sixties. Wow. Well, it seems like everything in computing was formulated by the sixties. So that tracks. Um, so you did then dig into PBR or physically based rendering. So like, yeah, what's the, what's the background on that, right? What makes it physically based in a way that past lighting models weren't? Um, I guess it's more because it's, it's, uh, it, um, matches, um, like, um, physical measurements better basically. Mm. That's how they, they, they there's way of, of uh, measuring materials, which I haven't read into closely, but there is like databases and stuff and there's methods for like mapping ah. how like the spectrum of how, how a material is reflecting and also scattering light sure. it receives. So that's, that's what they compare against, but also BRDFs themselves have, uh, have a couple of uh requirements to be considered physically accurate although most of the commonly used models don't uh, satisfy those so really but it's usually one of them it has to conserve energy uh, most models lose a bit of energy but that's usually not a big deal as long as you're not adding energy because then you, sure. you'll have the problem so sure so and and conserving energy, I guess you define it here for a for a perfectly white surface, the reflected energy must equal the amount received. I believe I have heard of this in the context of like specular reflections, for example, where it's very easy for your lighting calculations to result in a much brighter reflection than you should have, right? Which is sort of light coming from nowhere, right? Is that a, a correct way of thinking about it? Yeah, yes, at least in the in the microfacet model, which like every uh uh, PBR uh, solution is based on. Right. So before we get into that, what was the what were the resources that you looked at to learn this stuff? Uh, whatever paper I could find, Sorry. but like uh, did, did, but I found some good ones. Annoyingly, uh, after the jam, I found the like ultimate paper. Ooh. That like goes everything from the ground up. So my, I'm still studying well, that. Well, can you share the link and, somewhere, uh, like whether in the the chat or something? It'd yes, be fun to pull I'm. It up here um, on the I'm not logged in ah. currently, but well, I, I was. I, I'm planning to. I'm planning to share it uh, eventually once I have uh, gone through it. Sure. Okay. All. Well, that that but, looks cool. Uh, see, because because I I have looked at the Disney PBR paper before, which I know that you mentioned. Um, and it gave a bit of background on the whole micro facet thing, but 
Um, as I understand it, the, the idea of microfacet is to imagine the surface that you're shining a light on is made up of like all of these tiny reflective faces and you're sort of averaging or integrating over those in your, your calculations. Is that correct? Yeah, more or less. Sure. It's like um, instead of um, it's uh, it's quite clever because instead of like um, because the easiest way to do uh, to reflect light is to just uh, pretend the surface is a perfect mirror and and just reflect the incoming light vector. Huh? Mm -hmm. But uh, since uh, most surfaces aren't like that, how they do it is that instead they model a a uh, microsurface that is uh, that is too small to be seen, mm -hmm. and treat that as a mirror instead. So yeah, oh. the resulting reflection becomes like like in the case of rendering for each pixel, it becomes like yeah the statistical average of what will be going on in that surface area sure like so so the easiest way to describe it like you have your incoming light and if it's reflect reflecting on a mirror surface in order for you to see it it has to well align with the view vector right so like what the micro facet what what the whole uh all the terms does is then calculate like how um what percentage of those surfaces happens to be facing the view vector ah okay i mean that makes sense i guess so for a for a, yeah. if you were rendering a mirrored if if the object were polished perfectly like a mirror you would imagine then that this micro facet picture that you're seeing here would itself be smooth and all of these these facets would be pointing in the yeah, same direction. Yeah, that, that's how they that's how they uh, model it. But but it is interesting. I hadn't thought about it in the sense of like each each of these little facets is essentially a perfect mirror. It's just that by averaging them you get more more accurate rough results. Yeah, that that that's how they achieve roughness. Sure. So, was there what in this whole process was was something that surprised you or or stood out to you in a way you hadn't considered before? Oh, uh, I don't know everything. I guess <laughs> it, it's it, most of it was was uh, quite new. Oh, yeah, um, it's it's more of a physics thing. But I had never considered that diffuse reflection is actually a subsurface scattering effect. It's just at a smaller scale. Huh. So in the literature, that's what they count. Because lighting at its core, it's, it's either absorption or scattering. Okay. And scattering occurs and, and, and li like on the very basic level. And how light is um, breaking through, through a medium is determined by the index of refraction. And when you have a sudden change in the index of refraction, that's just like smaller than the that at wavelength scale, then the light will scatter. So, okay. for instance, when you have a when you have a solid object, and you have air, well, then the light hitting the surface of the object, you have a very sudden change in index of refraction. So then you will get what we call a reflection. But the reflection is actually just another form of scattering. Hmm. And some light may enter the surface and uh, scatter around there instead. And, and uh, some of the light might exit. And that's what we call subsurface scattering. But that's also what we would call diffuse hmm. reflection. Because when the light is going around inside the material, it will get filtered. So it will lose its its uh, yeah it will, it will uh, only retain the color, what we will call the color of the surface. Right. Interesting, because I I had heard of subsurface scattering only in the context of of stuff like this, where where you get the sort of glow from a light through things like skin, 
um, where where it's clear that the the light is, you know, it's not shining straight through, but it's not being blocked either. It's it's you know bouncing around. Some yeah, is being presumably absorbed. Some is being scattered. But that's essentially just true at like all scales, and that's basically what all lighting is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a matter of scale. Huh. Subsurf what we call subsurface scattering is just the effect at a much larger. The, the light is spreading further. Sure. Before it's exiting the surface again. Sure. And so for for but typical solid objects, it's just like an extremely small scale. Yeah, it's a smaller. Interesting area. How does that actually manifest the, in the lighting computation? Like, does it does it follow a sort of subsurface model, or is it simplified? Um, the the one I'm using as reference is the Disney one, which is quite interesting because they used um, uh, Merl, the the library is is called. They they um, compared with the physical data when they designed their their um, the new uh, shading models, and um, and they tr try to re recreate because there's a uh, since um, since diffuse reflection is a form of subsurface scattering, it it has this peculiar behavior where it's um, where it gets a bit brighter at uh, the silhouette, mm. where like uh, a shiny surface usually get, gets darker towards the silhouette, unless you mm. have Fresnel reflection. But for diffuse, it's the opposite, so you sort of get a shiny outline. You know, I had heard of Fresnel. Uh, I didn't realize that it was opposite for reflective surfaces. How does that? Okay, interesting. Or, that that question might take us over time, because <laughs> that might be a rabbit hole on its yeah. own. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, there's there there's uh, a lot of things to uh, to learn. I'm still uh, I'm still just scratching the surface, really. But uh, but yeah. It's uh, it's definitely been been enlightening and uh, yeah <laughs> and uh, so and, uh, and... I found you you linked the Disney paper in in your own paper so uh, if people are interested in learning more about this they can they can go look at that and the other resources that were shared here uh, to close things out. What other aspects of this are you planning to dig into in the future? Or what do you think you're going to do with, with this knowledge? Well, my plan for the jam was to, to actually implement a demo. Uh, that turned out to be over ambitious. So, but it as happens. soon as I'm, uh, as soon as I've read, uh, I'm finished with my current resource, I think I'm ready to go back and, um, and finish that. I'm uh, making it in shader toy. Sure. And um, yeah, cause I, cause I, I got a pretty good start, but I run into some problems with um, there was some uh, was getting incorrect result, and I wasn't sure why. Mm. Well, I there look was some to... information. Yeah, I look forward to I seeing that missing. when it when it comes out. Um, I'll be you can you can post that I suppose to your jam entry along with everything else so that people can see the, yeah. the full story of it even after the jam and uh for for the participants in the jam like i i do want to just say like don't be afraid to keep posting on this stuff as you keep learning right the the jam is not intended to be like the only time you ever learn about a subject it's really cool to see some people you know continuing that even still and i think we'll actually we'll we'll see one of those uh when we interview another one of our guests later in the show but uh, thank you so much for joining us and thanks for participating in the jam. So uh, hope you had a good time. Hope to, to see you next year when we do it again. And uh, with that, I will send you back to the waiting room. See you later. See ya. And we're going to flip things around now. Uh, we are going to actually get Colin in here to chat with me briefly about my my project uh since colin wanted to do it so we're we're gonna do it uh actually can i just drag him in i was gonna like tell him to get in here but do i have the power i have the power hey colin oh hey yeah that's working here, let me get my camera on for you 
Sure. Yeah. In the Unwind studio. Hello. Good to see you. Um, yeah. You can't see time. me, unfortunately, because I did not set this up that way. <laughs> but, well, oh well. We'll manage. Cool. Yeah. So, um, Spectre, how did you get there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, well, let me let me pull up my my project in my my other browser here, uh, just for a bit. Oh my god, I didn't link it from my jam page. <laughs> I'm terrible at this. Hang on. Uh, so I don't know really. It just I was I was keeping an eye out for uh jam topics as we were leading up to it, and I was learning about some of these things related to work. I think it the the topic of these security vulnerabilities came up and I realized, you know, Spectre is one of those things that I hear about again and again, where it's like, oh, we have to be careful of Spectre vulnerabilities here, or we have to, you know, this could be used for a Spectre attack. Um, right. Especially now that I'm working on browsers directly, we have to sometimes mm -hmm. be mindful of like, are the operations we're doing Spectre opportunities? I'm like, I don't know what that means. And I don't know how I would recognize one. And <laughs> for all I know, I would be introducing nasty security bugs into Firefox just, you know, without meaning to. So I figured I should probably learn that. Um, also, a coworker of mine had sat me down in person at the last company All Hands to try and explain it to me. And I did not really get it. So I right. figured, hey, let me let me take another crack at this. Make sure that I properly understand it. Yeah, a lot of the explainers that I've seen have uh, almost gotten it and kind of missed the boat. Um... It's it's interesting picking through some of the uh, the TILs you've posted here. Like people were extracting data via cache timing attacks in two thousand and five. I, I that's news to me. That's really neat. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> that's still something I don't understand because it's something that my coworker had told me, which is that like all the like Spectre is really simple, and all of the ingredients were well known for a long time before Spectre was right. disclosed. So, like, really, he said any ambitious even undergrad could probably have found Spectre and yet it just seemed to lay low for some reason. I still don't really lot. understand. Yeah. Well, I, so I've, I've played a little bit with timing attacks with like uh, FPGAs. You can get far, hmm. far better timing with FPGAs. It's not like a completely unknown thing. Yeah. It's, it is kind of baffling that Spectre took so long. The other one that I thought was fascinating, I think we talked about this ahead of time, um, but performance now has some weirdness right <laughs> well so you can kind of just work around it but. yeah so as i understand it chrome decided as a specter mitigation to reduce the precision of timers maybe i should get into what the actual like mechanism of specter is for yes. people who are, are unfamiliar um so i'm i i hope that the information generally about how speculative execution in CPUs works, I hope that's generally correct enough to convey the, the right, you know, mental model. Um, this is a very toy example of how pipelining and, and out of order execution would work. But the basic idea of Spectre, as I now understand it, is to take advantage of the fact that, first of all, CPUs will actually execute instructions out of order and speculatively, meaning that the instructions they're executing are not necessarily the instructions that should execute, but in order to keep things running concurrently and to sort of keep the data pipeline full, they will predict which branch to go down and sometimes execute code that they shouldn't, but it's fine because they'll just roll it back if it turns out to be wrong, right? So you waste computation sometimes, but you get better performance overall. But what Spectre takes advantage of is the fact that those rollbacks are not perfect. They uh, actually do leave side effects on the system, and some of those side effects can be observed. And the big one that was disclosed in the Spectre paper was that speculative execution still affects the memory cache, like the L1, L2 caches. Okay. That's and, right. well, so speculative loads from memory just go into the cache like normal loads from memory, right. which allows you to then the it's it was not the the thing that was really confusing to me before I started digging into this was like, okay, cool. So that makes enough sense, right? Memory ends up in the cache. Now you know that that memory was in the cache. How do you steal data with that? Like 
how do you actually figure out what the contents of memory were by using a timer to just look at how quick things are loading? That did not make sense to me. Um, I do have an interactive demo here for timing attacks in general. Oh my God, my password manager. <laughs> my password manager activates whenever I try to use this demo. Um, anyway, what this will do is it will give you sort of the basic idea of timing attacks, but what it doesn't do is actually kind of explain. It, it doesn't get to the actual specter part. That's the part that I have in this sketch down here where I planned to make a demo and then ran out of time. So oops, should have prioritized the demos in a different order probably, but. So what is the actual specter part? Is it the specter part um... is that you have the CPU first speculatively load an address from memory and mm -hmm. second use that value in another speculative operation that exposes the value to you so the way that they okay. set it up in the paper is that they first have the cpu load one of these like secret bytes here so maybe it would load byte 991 right memory address 991 which contains the value 8 and then you use that as an index into an array that is completely cleared from cache. So that now element eight is the hot one. Oh. And the fact that address eight is the hot one tells you that eight was the secret value that was stored there. It was this two stage thing that I did not really understand. Now part of this, in my opinion, is because the Spectre paper just has array one and array two as the names for things, which I found confusing but the the big realization i had after beating my head against it for a while and talking with negate was that the first the first array access here because you can you can see that the the operation here is basically just access array one of x for some reason whatever x is and then access array two with that value multiplied by 4096 this is just for cache reasons like to make sure that you're respecting cache lines and you can kind of ignore it for the concept. But the thing I did not understand was that array one of X here, this is basically just a pointer. Like, like you can kind of think of X as a relative, that your goal is to target a specific location in memory. And you can do that with arrays by thinking of it as sort of a relative pointer to the base of the array. Okay. Right, the offset, a, a, an array index is essentially just an offset from the array base. So it's sort of just a relative pointer. You can treat it like a pointer. And the, the important thing for Spectre is just that you load an address of your choice from memory, which is what the, the array one of X does. And then you use that in an operation that you can run a cache timing attack on. So it's actually pretty simple, which is again, it's like, how did it take people so long to notice this? Once the idea of a cache timing attack was already out there in the wild. It's it's really sure. wild. Um, so that that was probably the the overall eureka moment for me on this one. It's hmm. just oh, the first one is loading a value. The second one is using the value. Then you just time it to find what the value was. All the other details are just like how do we make it practical? Okay, sure, fascinating. I guess to go back to the performance.now thing, because you mentioned there's weirdness around that, my understanding is that they just tried to mitigate this by making timers suck so that you couldn't really yep. get fine-grained enough timing yes. to, to do a, this practically. That's been a thing across the board. Uh, lots and lots of places have tried to make their timers worse. Yeah. But then, uh, again, my coworker told me, this turns out to not really matter <laughs> because you can essentially synthesize arbitrary precision timers <laughs> just by like combining different timing sources and sort of spreading things out and and there's really no good way to do this and like in the specter paper they directly talked about an alternate an alternative timer strategy which involves using a shared array buffer in the browser to decrement a a value just using atomics and this can occur with enough precision that it basically acts as a timer when you just read the value of that atomic from the other, uh, from the from the main page. So, yeah. 
there's there's and this is why i guess i hear about it so much working at mozilla is just like oh uh, i don't know can this thing be accessed by multiple threads can this thing like operate with enough observed precision that it could be used as a timer then uh oh maybe we're specturing <laughs> so there's not really a good way to mitigate that though like well i mean we want everything to run kind of randomly or slowly I, yeah no it's it sucks and i do i think have a better appreciation now for why specter mitigations would suck in multiple ways like you slow things down maybe by like removing a lot of these side channel things flushing caches clearing various things out so that there's no timing to observe which just slows the system down or you just kind of degrade timing and measurement across the board to just make it impractical to do this like it's technically still there and you can get good enough timers if you really work hard, but like we're just gonna make timers suck bad enough that it's not useful anymore. And that also is, is obviously kind of bad. It's no win. Right. Yeah, it's fascinating. So, so um was your was your focus very specifically on Spectre? Did you kind of go from Spectre to timing tax and back again? What was the path here? It was pretty much just Spectre, because it's okay. such a cause I knew that it was a broad thing. I guess. Yeah. Um, and it was just a, I knew that it was one that hadn't gone away, that it's not like fixable really. <laughs> um, right. I did yeah. look briefly at the meltdown paper and that one just sounds hilarious uh -huh. because as far as I can tell, it's basically specter, but what if CPUs also ignored memory protection, <laughs> which, right. yeah. which is insane. Like I, I, I mean, if, if that is truly like the, the extent of the issue, that is a hilarious, hilarious bug. I remember reading a paper that was similar on the Apple uh, ARM M chips. Um, they were doing some kind of prefetching that was prefetching memory that it shouldn't have had access to, I think. Hmm. Um, I don't remember exactly where that went, but same kind of yeah. same kind of thing. It's It happens everywhere. It's really hard to avoid. Yeah. Well, and now um, Casey just put out this video a couple videos but but basically one video about the uh what's it called go fetch vulnerability in apple's m1 chips which from what i understand is essentially kind of a specter like attack it's more subtle than what's presented here but another performance focused feature within the cpu the data memory prefetcher yeah i think that's what i was talking about yeah yeah Oh, oh, was that the same thing? Okay, yeah. Because because so. what I understand that to be is like a prefetcher that actually will go fetch memory based on the contents of other memory that gets loaded into the cache, which again you can construct timing attacks around <laughs> to expose the the values that were actually stored in in memory just by convincing the the right things to be loaded the right things to be evicted and observing yep. the timing on that. Although I believe, um, so this might be wrong because, because Casey even had to do like a, a update video to clarify some information, but it's a very different type of timing attack where you sort of, I understand it to be that you keep writing to a location and wait for something to become slow indicating mm -hmm. that the other process evicted that address from memory so it's sort of like the opposite of, of what i'm doing for all i know i just got prime and probe backwards in in my explainer here one of the things that i want to look into more is the the paper uses all this terminology of like evict and load or prime and probe and a few other things that are like named timing attack strategies and I guess there were papers on those in isolation. And I, it's probably worthwhile for me to go learn about those in more detail. So I have a little more understanding of, of how the specific, how specifically you can perform the timing attack piece of it. Because right. there's one of the other things the Spectre paper highlights is in principle, there's basically no preventing this because the speculative execution does use CPU resources. It sort of inevitably has some observable side effects. You know, whether that's just resource contention and like, well, all the arithmetic units are saturated right now and they mm -hmm. saturate in different ways when you're speculatively loading this address versus another. And it's like, oh, right. goodness, this, this is awful. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it would so be good to at least. 
I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. At least yeah. I, I, you know, hopefully I can start recognizing these situations in real life a little better. I, cause the, the core idea of just, Hey, if you allow high precision timers and arbitrary memory access, like, you know, like array buffers and that kind of thing, the combination of those things can be nasty if you're not careful. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it strikes me as just a general family of ideas that I need to learn more about and more specific examples in. I'm not sure I could really practically apply this yet, but I do feel like at least through this, this jam, the, the big picture clicked for me in a way that it did not before. And so hopefully I'll be a little better able to understand all of the specifics now. Sweet. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I didn't actually catch your um, full blog post because it wasn't on the <laughs> wasn't on your page until uh, just now. But yeah, I'm that's that's cool. That. And I'll have to fix that after the jam or after the stream here. Oops. But uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I apparently I really didn't post it with a TIL, so it just didn't go onto my page. Oops. Yep. Well, it happens. Sweet, man. Well, uh, thank you for having me on. I'm excited about this. Uh, <laughs> thank you for interviewing me on on the show that I'm hosting. <laughs> so. I'm yeah. going to, let's see, who's, who's next on the list here? Uh, we've got Dan, Dan Wilhelm. Uh, let me pull him in here for his own intro. Uh, thanks for joining me, Colin. Now get out. Uh, hello, Dan. Oop, that didn't work. <laughs> uh, one second while we, we sort this out. Okay. Are we good now? Nope. I think he keeps turning his camera off or, or something. Yeah. Well, we'll get this sorted. Not a big deal. Asaf is dutifully doing tech support. The whole setup we have here is just kind of odd because we have the like waiting room channel and then I try to pull people in from there. But then it turns people's cameras off and then they have to turn them on again and so on. Let me just do I need to bring back the lo-fi, the very quiet lo-fi, the elevator music. Audio problems, alas. Well, I'll just do the intro now. So, uh, Dan is actually a longtime community member. I think he has probably, I'm pretty sure he's been at all the Handmade Seattle conferences. He's been around the, the online community for a long time. And his submission for the Learning Jam is actually a book that he's been working on about neural nets and sort of reverse engineering them, building them up from first principles. And this was my first time ever digging into this topic in any amount of technical detail. And I got to say, I was really impressed by what he's put together so far. Um, I hope that I can get him on here soon, but I'm really excited to chat with him about the, the whole topic. Obviously, language models are a big topic <laughs> in the current time. And it's really cool to see people in the community digging into how they work, digging into the actual math behind them, the understanding behind them. So how much longer can I stall for time? Ah, how's chat doing? Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Hope you're enjoying our most bug ridden stream ever.
Perhaps I should take this time. Oh, he's ready. We're going now. All right. Lo-fi off. Dan on. You there, Dan? Oh my God. Why? What is happening? Why, why are we just getting, why is he getting ping-ponged around? Let me try dragging it from over here. Okay. Hello, Dan. Hello? I can hear you. <laughs> we did it. All right. All right. Sorry about all that mess. I don't know what was going on. Oh, no problem. I think I was just in the wrong room. But uh, th thanks. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, sure. I should be able to. Sh I'll I think because of the way I have this set up, I'm going to have to show. How am I going to do this? One second. Uh, I'll have to show sure. that instead of your face. But, um, well. No problem. No, we'll go to the Discord emergency layout that I have, which just shows uh just shows the the discord view so we'll see your face next to your screen okay that sounds fancy so so go ahead and share ready anytime nice uh led matrix by the way thank you thank you Oh, I see. So I'm going to share the entire screen here. Sure. All right. Hopefully that works well. Uh oh, I'm um, not but... seeing it come through in Discord yet. Why is that? Okay, it says I'm live. Um, let me, you know, this also says you're live. I got to close my pop out and reopen it. <laughs> One second, because I think uh, I got to quit the whole call. Well, I could just start uh, chatting about the projects, and I'll just uh, leave my screen up. No, I got you now. I got it figured out. Forgot how Discord okay, works. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, hey, everyone. Uh, my name's Dan, and this is my first jam with the Handmade community. So thank you for putting this on, Ben. Um, so I'm going to just talk about, like, what is my project? And then we had two parts, the learning part and the teaching part. And then just briefly, some next steps. So I've been studying large language models for the last, for about a year. And I thought it would be fun to, to sort of make some teaching materials for those. And um, I realized a while back that there may be an opportunity to learn about how they work from a very low level. So that's is what inspired this project. And if you're curious, you can see, so I'm still in the very early stages, but I'm putting everything up at llmsbook.com. Um, and so I got it. So this is sort of what I've been working on. Uh, currently it's called LLM Foundations for Large Language Models, um, where we're going to basically be building these from scratch, just using uh, like basic, math and python and um, i before the jam i had already written chapter one and i was planning to do chapter two uh, but i tur it turned out that i after i did the learning part for chapter two i thought that i should revise chapter one make it clearer and so so my learning part was for chapter two but i ended up revising chapter one for the for the teaching part what, uh, so the way this started was I was doing some monthly algorithmic problems that I just saw online. This is from sort of a, a um, LLM like boot camp sort of thing in London called Arena. And uh, Callum McDougall runs that. And he was just coming up with these problems where you take an existing transformer and a transformer is like the building blocks of a large language model and then you analyze it and so i started uh writing some some analyses of transformers that callum made and uh you know there's just a lot of like it's all written in python and it's uh 
you know, we're just trying to analyze something that's been trained by the computer and try to figure out like how it works. And so it turns out that I actually did figure out how these things worked. And I figured out that I could actually design them myself just using like a minimal number of weights, like in this particular one, only using 38 weights. And then I did another one that Callum made. Uh, and I realized you can also do that one using a minimal number of weights. And I thought, wow, this would make a really great like introduction to if we just design these ourselves, a great introduction to how like large language models might work if we design these circuits ourselves. And so I thought, I initially thought, well, let's make like a YouTube series. But my second video ended up being over two hours. And I was like, this, you know, I can't sit still for two hours. And so I started on this, on just writing everything down. So that's sort of the origin story of this, of how it got started. And uh, the first chapter here was on, I, I wanted to motivate these by having like, having us do things right from the beginning. So chapter one is on, can we solve cryptograms by designing a transformer? And then, it, and so this sort of walks through like the first part of how the transformer works, which is like an input embedding and then the attention block and then an unembedding. And we walk through how we can like design that from scratch. And then for chapter two, I wanted to start on the second part of the transformer, which is there's the attention block and then there's like a feed, a traditional feed forward neural net. And I wanted to do that in chapter two. So um, that was sort of where I was at before the learning jam. And so for the learning jam, I wanted to do the learning part of chapter two and then uh, sort of write that. So, so my inspiration for chapter two was this article by Stephen Wolfram. Uh, this was pretty, pretty popular when it came out. And it's what is ChatGPT doing and why does it work? And if you sort of scroll down in this very lengthy article, you'll see down here that Stephen Wolfram uh, trains some really basic nets. And he discovers that the larger the net actually approximates the function he was trying to approximate even better. So just, just for illustration here, uh, this this is the target function, and then he designs this neural net and trains it to have this try to approximate this target function. And so you can see when there aren't very many neurons, it does a poor job of approximating it. But when he has a lot of neurons, that does a much better job of approximating it. And so I was following along in this article, and I was just curious about exactly like what was going on and whether I could do even better than, than Wolfram did here. And by better, I mean, you know, he used an automatic training process where, where the, all of these neurons are like, the, they, they have weights associated with them, and those weights are solved for by, by the computer. Um, but there might be an opportunity if you create these weights by hand and understand how they work, there might be an opportunity just with four neurons here to correctly approximate the function. Hmm. And so just to show you like how, how, I, how I worked on this. So in this article, it turns out, and this is one of the really cool things about like Mathematica is you can just click on Wolfram's articles and then you can open up Mathematica and you can just paste. Oh, and then you can see here these gray functions. These are actually going across the network and so, for example, like this piecewise data 1D, this net graph plot, these are all functions that are stored on a remote server. So it's actually downloading those from a remote server, and then it's running this code. And you can see I can actually uh, make this exact same plot in my local like Mathematica version. And I was doing this, I should point out, just for education purposes because i i just have the home edition of mathematica <laughs> i've not seen mathematica in a really long time like i used it a bit in college and and that's it it's fun to see it in use again oh yes kind of yes <laughs> yeah 
So it actually like I'm I it, it does have some really cool things for examining neural nets. Uh, you know, that's actually been one of the main focuses of the later versions. And it lets you visualize neural networks in a really nice way and lets you train them really easily and lets you visualize them really easily because you can sort of just target certain parts of the network and you can see exactly all the, all the uh, underlying numbers. Mm. So I had fun, like when I first started my neural net journey, I had Mathematica and I thought, oh, this would be a really fun way to learn about neural nets, like using Mathematica. And so, so it's kind of, kind of an interesting, interesting approach. Um, but yeah, since I had it and I had this article, I was just like, well, let's just use the article. And so what I wondered was, was, you know, can I, can I understand what's going on? and then actually do this with only four neurons, like approximate this function. And then I thought that would make a really nice, like learning article if I wrote about that. And so that was my inspiration for the jam. Nice. And it turns out you can actually approximate this, this square wave just by using four neurons. And so I grabbed the data <laughs> from Mathematica. So it, it ends up like, here's the 16, neuron version so th these are all of the weights if you have 16 neurons and it turned out it was a little bit tricky for me to like look at all of these in here so i actually like put them into excel <laughs> and uh organized them all and i tried to understand like what exactly was going on in excel and so i started out with 16 neurons and i figured out some patterns like some ways that i could collapse neurons into one and I got it down to eight neurons down here. And then I figured out the, the overall pattern and I got it down just to four neurons. Huh. And so, so there was just that much redundancy in the original model? Exactly, yeah. So a lot of these neurons were actually duplicated. Like uh, you can sort of see it up here. Like, uh, like these two neurons have the same like slope as it will, like basically these numbers are very, very similar to each other. So I can collapse these two into one neuron mm. and the same over here. Like these two numbers are very similar, so I can collapse them and it all works out mathematically. Mm. And so once you're down to four neurons, I put that back into Mathematica to visualize it and uh, sort of, and so it, I, I found out that you can sort of approximate this square wave almost arbitrarily exactly. And the way, the way it works basically, just really briefly, is when a neural net, like if you have four neurons like this, and then just one on the output, so this is sort of the output. Sorry, my handwriting's terrible here. That's fine, you're good. <laughs> Uh, but, um, yeah, if you, if you have just four neurons like that, it just sums them up. And so the way this works is each individual neuron, if you visualize it is actually a ramp. So it sort of looks like this, like this is one neuron. And so then another neuron might look like here, I'll choose a different color. It might look like this coming along the top and then going and then going down, mm. except these extend the whole way. Right, I was, I was wondering about that. I figured they had to in order to combine. Exactly. And so what happens is uh, if you sum all, all four of these up, they end up canceling each other out. Mm. My, my handwriting's not too good today, but here's another one. So they all look like this. And if you sum them all up, like if you look at a point way out here, um, like this, this slope and this slope cancel each other out. Oh. And then this one up at one and this one down at negative one cancel each other out. And so you get a Y equals zero line. Interesting. So it's a little, it's a little weird, but that's how it works. If you just have a single layer of four neurons. And this is actually like you, you may hear in neural net theory that 
if you just have a single layer of neurons, you can, you can actually approximate any function. And the reason why that is, is because you can build square waves like this, and you can make arbitrarily many of these, and you can sort of use these square waves to approximate any function just by building it out of these square waves. Hmm. So I thought, you know, I, so I figured this out, and now that I know how it works, I can probably write something that approximates any function, and that would be a really nice, like, addition to the book. So that was my learning portion. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so, so you then rewrote the, the chapter one for the jam, right, as I understand it? Yes. And, and, yeah, that's and then the, just... I was just reading through that in detail finally this morning in preparation for this. And it was, it was I, I thought it was really cool to see something that, like, had concrete numbers for a lot of these parameters that didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Because so, yes. so yeah. for for context, as I understand it, and like the the basic structure here that you set up is a neural net for uh, undoing Caesar ciphers, which are just simple letter rotation ciphers where like A becomes B, B becomes C and so on. Um, yes. And you're able to do this by choosing like your neurons, the well, maybe maybe that's the wrong terminology, but like the the weights on things are just the actual frequencies of letters in the English language and then like rotated by however much the, the rotation is in order to solve it. So these numbers are actually motivated by something, which is nice to see. Yeah, exactly. So the idea is you put in the ciphertext. So if you, you can put in D E D B as the ciphertext and you put that into the neural net or the, or the transformer, and then that outputs the rotation. So here, D, E, D, B is ro a rotated version of A, Bay. And then when it comes out of the neural net, we want it to say that, oh, this the rotation was a rotation of three. Right. And so the idea how that works is uh, it just does it how a human would do it. It statistically does it. So it counts up how many times each letter occurs, and then it compares that distribution of free of letter frequencies to what we'd expect with each rotation so like the letter e is the most common letter so you could think of well the it, it might assume that the most common letter here is an e and if you know what the most common letter is you can guess what the rotation is and so um and so that's basically like how how it works out and then the way this 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 book works just briefly is I'm actually using So I'm actually using MD book which is what Rust uses for its documentation. Mm -hmm. And then I have it set up so that it's all like written in markdown basically. And you can sort of see like this summary.md is this sidebar over here. And then you just write each markdown file and save it. And then when you're done, you can just compile the book. You can just do MD book serve dash dash open. And then it builds all of these into HTML files. And then it lets you preview it in your, in your browser. It's basically like a static site generator. Mm -hmm. But I have it set up so that I just Com make commits to GitHub, and then it automatically, once I push that onto GitHub, it automatically like puts it up on llmsbook.com. So it's kind of a slick system. So I can just locally edit it, yeah. then push it to GitHub, and then it automatically updates up here. Um, so I, I set up a lot of this for the jam, like I didn't have llmsbook.com before. <laughs> And uh, well, the jam let me do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the jam let me like um, put this on a more uh, on a better footing. So yeah. So I'm grateful for that. So what's the uh, the near term plans for this? Then are you just going to keep cranking out chapters, or what's the how many chapters do you think it's going to have by the time it's done? Well, I'm I'm curious about that myself. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so a lot a lot of times when I. So my, the way I approach projects for learning is I just sort of just dive in and I'm like, oh, this would be a really cool 
like introduction and then I just see how far I can go. And that's my strategy here too. Sure. <laughs> I I want to work up to things where that do complex to uh, to like real large language models with lots of parameters and I just want to see how far I can take it. Like how big can I get these models just by designing them from scratch? Yeah. And so um well, I really, I, I really liked what I, I saw in chapter one. Um, I felt like, you know, obviously it's, it's very, very beginner stuff and a very new topic for me, but, um, I, I really did appreciate just the, the structure that you had here. I like the approach. I, I like that you've managed to truly strip away like all the magic at the start and go with hopefully some intuition of what these weights even are that, that makes some sense. I would be really curious exactly. to, and that's to read the, more of this. That's the goal. Having intuition about how the, gaining intuitions from small models that might help you understand larger ones. Yeah. And, and that's what we do, you know, with handmade stuff in general, right? Like by understanding things at a really low level, that helps us build complex systems right. that well, are more I mean, robust. I right? wonder if like if if wolfram might have noticed the the redundancies in his own net there it's like funny to see well, that i'm the, sure i'm sure it's I obviously mean, fine to design it that <laughs> way in practice it's just funny to me that that something like this would be you know well once you actually understand how these weights work and how the process works maybe you can recognize like oh this thing's tuned wrong it has a lot of redundancy that doesn't need to be there right you actually have some intuition oh yeah and I'm I'm sure Wolfram would would have figured it out, but he well, was no just doubt, but... he was using the computer to train it. Yeah, so which I know the, is what people do. The, the but thing... I'm I'm really interested in seeing like what is the what is the actual approach without the training part of it because that's everything I've ever seen as an intro is just like you just fuss with the weights until it does the thing, and it's exactly and that's what I don't like about neural nets because a lot of it is. Like you, you probably know from computer science, like you can't just tweak things in an algorithm and hope that the algorithm work, like tweak your code in the algorithm and just hope that it works, right? Yeah. Like if you understand how the algorithm works, that'll let you implement the algorithm even better. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Um, I, I look forward to seeing all the future chapters of this book. I believe, yeah, Asaf linked it in the chat so people can go go check that out. And yeah, thanks Great. so much thanks for, a lot, for participating in the jam. It's really, really cool to, to see this submission. And I'm super excited to see where you take this. Thanks. And thanks for hosting. Yeah, of course. Uh, and uh, I guess questions can be answered in the chat. So there's, there's a couple questions in chat. Excellent. Yeah, I'll take a look. All right. Well, we have just one more guest today. And that is Martin Fiel, the author of Orca. I'm going to... Oh. Hold on, I can switch back now to my uh, proper scene here and pull Martin in. Did it work? Hey. Hello. What on? <laughs> uh, oh, show all participants. There we go. Hear me? Again, I'm figuring Discord out. Uh, yes, I can hear you just fine. OK, let me turn on my camera. Good. I can see it. Hey. I guess you can't see my thumbs up because of the way we've, we've done this. Uh, yeah. I can't Trust me, see. I can see you. I can hear you. Hopefully, you okay. know. Okay. Nice. So yeah, let me, let me, I mean, I'm sure that for everybody watching this stream, Martin needs no introduction, right? He's the, the creator of Orca and, and vector graphics renderers predating Orca and um, PhD and all kinds of other things. And for the learning jam, he dove into colors. Uh, so what was what was the motivation there? Within your jam project, you took kind of the perspective of I'm going to fix gamma issues within Orca. Was that like the actual motivation for this or just a, a happy outcome? Uh, well, the the motivation for it was uh, I just in the last couple months uh, working in graphics stuff and I'm I'm not a graphics programmer and I, I worked in graphics both for Orca and for the contract uh, work and so I've done uh, quite um, a bit of work on vector graphics render but I had never uh, dug into how you deal with colors so I would just like uh, okay, colors are RGB values, and you pass that in, and it creates color. 
And obviously I discovered that uh, I was uh, kind of wrong about that. And I was also trying to look for a um, topic that was small enough that I could fit that in a weekend. And I told myself, okay, colors, uh, that, that seemed to be simple enough. Uh, and it turned out to be like really wrong. Uh, there's like a lot that goes into color and color spacing and color management. Um, and that was fun. But the, the part of like fixing the, the stuff in Orca is like a byproduct. I just wanted to learn something fun for two days and I thought it would be enough. And, uh, and I just discovered a whole new topic to learn. So that's, nice. that's pretty cool. Well, I have gotten through two parts of your videos. Uh, you're the only one, I believe, who submitted videos for for the project. So that was that was really fun to see. And I oh, think that... yeah, that, that was my my second mistake. <laughs> I thought doing a video would be simpler than doing a blog post. Well, I mean, for the amount of visuals that you had to put together, I kind of think that might be true. Um, and it's really nice that in video you can like. So so I pulled up. I tried to pull up here on stream the. 3D plot that you did of the uh, X Y or it's not the X Y Z the like chromaticity space which uh, as so so is it correct the the thing that you plotted that's sort of the the cone that's like taking the um, color response curves that you were plotting before and just like using them as 3D coordinates to draw the kind of outline of or or is that yeah incorrect? exactly okay. Uh, yeah, you have those uh, those uh, response curves that are color matching functions. So basically, you you put some color on screen and you ask someone to adjust LED value or uh, RGB values to um, to match that color, and you report that on the table for all the monochromatic uh, colors you can um, you can see. Yeah, and so um, and so then you can uh, just plot that in 3D and that gives you like the path in 3D uh, that you have to go through to to hit all the monochromatic colors. And you know that any color is uh, can be any color then we can see can be built from like a linear combination of uh, these monochromatic uh, colors. Uh, so so it gives you that kind of, of surface and of course you can vary the light intensity so that that surface uh, can extend from the origin to like right. basically the infinity. So you have some kind of weird shaped cone of all the colors you can see, and that's what what I tried to plot. Um, well, yeah, but then through. then in this first video, you take it further, and then uh, you like do you take a, a slice of it or project it somehow down to just the I believe the RG plane was that correct? Yeah. So the thing is. Um, you're you're not like super interested in the absolute values of the R G and B um, coordinates because like it uh, it depends on the um, the brightness of mm. the test light. So what you do is that you normalize uh, that by the sum of all three, and so what you get I is see. like the proportion of red, green, and blue that you have uh, to match the test light. And so since you divide, since you normalize, you know that the sum is always equal to one. So you can like just drop one uh, component uh, that you can rebuild from the other two. Gotcha. So ah, OK, now that, that makes more sense now from, from seeing the code that you were doing in these videos. I, I think I get now why you would do that. Yeah, you have uh, R equal, equal like the like the real R value that divided by the sum of R plus G plus B, uh, the same for G and the same for B. But then you know that B, that your small B is equal to one minus R minus G. And so you, you can just drop it and you project everything on the RG plane. And that's what gives you the, the CIE chromaticity diagram, which is this kind of tongue shape or horseshoe shaped mm -hmm. uh, gamut that um, shows you all the chromaticities that your eye can see. And then inside that, you can, um, you can plot the gamuts of different color spaces. Generally, you use like three uh, primary colors. So the gamut you have with three prim primary colors is a triangle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, it's nice to visualize the fact that 
if you draw any triangle inside that tongue shaped thing, there are a lot of colors that you can't hit. So any uh, three stimulus uh, color system that uses like three pr primary colors will have some colors that you can't you, you can't see but you can't reproduce them using that mm -hmm. system. So it's a way to understand that like your screen can't reproduce a lot of colors. And uh, same thing for like printers. They use four, um, but basically they use three colors and they just had a black color because it's not easy to make with um, other um, colors of ink. But there are also a lot of colors that you can't uh, really reproduce. And so the question is, if you go from one color space, so one set of primary colors to another, there are, there is a mismatch between the two color spaces. So there are some colors that you had represented in your first color space that you can't represent in your second color space. So you have to do some kind of matching to the closest color you can represent. So visualizing these chromaticity diagrams um, explains why you can't fit all the colors you can see in, into like just three uh, red, green, blue values, Right. Uh, which is something that it, I just didn't know. Um, I, yeah, I naively thought, thought that you could just like uh, do any color with RGB because we have RGB cones. And sure. All, uh, so. Right. I mean, it, it does make sense, I guess. Right. But so one you I, I have up on screen right now, the process of creating the I believe it's the XYZ uh, color space where you take these imaginary colors outside of the chromaticity diagram but that encompass the entire chromaticity diagram so that yeah. you you have now a basis that can produce everything even though it takes like primitive values that are impossible for a human to perceive at least yeah um that's also something that's kind of uh confusing at first because yeah you're using primaries that don't make any kind of physical sense and and you build them in a in a weird way by like choosing them to align one one of your color matching functions to like the the perceived brightness uh, and the other two just to make sure you can like fit all the um, the gamut of the human vision inside this triangle. Yeah. And so it, it's kind of weird because it it's like an absolute um, color space that is used everywhere to match between different color spaces. Uh, right, and I but... wanted to to ask you about that. So, as I understand it now, and this is something I think I, I realized watching your videos, is that the the chromaticity diagram is it is all plotting human response to light, correct? So, this is why it can be used as the sort of absolute space for things like print and for things like screens. Is that as long as you have a way of mapping back to this, this is just sort of a map of how the human eye yeah. reacts to light stimulus. And so as long as you can in some way like document how your primitives map to human light perception, then you can match this into the sort of absolute color space. Yeah. So the, the thing is, uh, although you have uh, primary colors in the system that are not like physical, like physical things, you have color matching functions that allows you to match, uh, to match, uh, to, like that allows you to match a color using those imaginary primaries. Basically, if you have a color, you can, uh, you can see, uh, you can know how much I would need those, um, the proportion I would need of uh, each of those uh, uh, imaginary primary colors to match my, my destination color. Right, and so each each point in that space defines a color in a an ambiguous way, um, like and and uh, also like the um, this is all standardized with respect to like uh, what are the viewing condition to match those colors. So for example, uh, you have to to watch it on such and such uh, lighting condition because your perception of colors will depend on on the lighting conditions. So. They, they made all that to make sure that um, the colors don't depend on external factors, like what is your monitor, what is the external lighting. Uh, even the field of view is uh, specified, so I, I think it's a, a five degree field of view. 
And so it all allows you to build that space that is an absolute color space and that doesn't make references to something else so that you can use that as a way to translate between, uh, okay. between systems that are more practical, like using RGB lights, using CMYK inks, um, and things that are like physically uh, realizable. Right. And yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think that I had myself a misconception that the sort of chromaticity diagram was somehow about RGB still, because it's like just this weird plot that still is drawn with a lot of red, green, and blue. I was sort of like not really yeah. understanding the perspective that it was coming from, that it was not yeah, about, also... that it was not about like emitted primary colors of light, which is like my entire conception of what light is. <laughs> Yeah. Also, the, the the thing you have to to be careful about is that most of the colors you see in in those plots are not actually like sure. Like these are colors that you can't represent on the screen. So we just right. put a color that is close enough. You know, it's it's funny but, now that you mention that because I've seen chromaticity diagrams with triangles drawn in them that are like this is the RGB gamut or whatever. I never really thought about yeah. the fact that, okay, so clearly everything outside the triangle is fake, <laughs> assuming this yeah, is the gamut exactly. that I'm using. They are basically just like clipped values. Yeah. And so it clips to red or it, it clips to blue. And that's why like a lot of these colors are kind of uniform and uh, it, it kind of uh, varies between all the colors you can see on your screen in the middle and like you have a big globe that is just like one color and it's, it's just a lot of colors but that can't be represented so they are just um, squashed to what your screen can represent yeah well there are many other topics that you covered in your videos as well so i particularly enjoyed the the stuff on gamma because like i i like this perspective of learning about gamma by fixing gamma bugs <laughs> Because it's actually kind of yeah. nice to see the before and after the like the the different ways that you can transform it wrong. Because that's I feel like the actual programmer experience working with these things is like, yeah. hmm, this just sort of looks off. I wonder why. And it's it was actually really nice to to watch through the the video and see. Oh, interesting. So he blitted the output in with with the correct gamma but he was doing color mixing and image scaling with uh i forget if it was if you were doing it you were doing it in srgb instead of blending yeah, well, in linear the, the space the thing or that's whatever. very uh unintuitive and confusing is that if you don't care about gamma you're actually doing things in srgb space because your your uh, screen expects srgb sure. um well, your graphic system expects sRGB. So if you are doing things without uh, without knowing about uh, gamma, um, you are mixing values and then passing them to your graphic system. And it takes those, those values are sRGB. So it is as if you were doing the mixing is in sRGB, even though you were never thinking about sRGB. And also the the, the naming is confusing here because um, in many graphics API, you can create like an sRGB frame buffer. And what it means is that you can pass linear values, like you can write linear values to that frame buffer, and it will be automatically converted under the hood to sRGB. And if you have a non sRGB buffer and you write your values in, uh, it's actually it's up to you to make the conversion. So if you are not thinking about uh, gamma, you are actually writing sRGB values to that non-sRGB buffer. So the naming, I found oh, it quite, yeah. uh, quite um, right. confusing. <laughs> and, and you have the reverse, there, the reverse problems for your input texture if you're sampling for, uh, from images. Um, so it's the, the same thing. If you have like a linear texture, you will just write values as is. Yeah. And if it's an sRGB texture, it will do the decoding uh, on your behalf. So, um, so there, are, and also there are two different places where it can go wrong, and sometimes you can be wrong in both, and it will look right. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, that's yeah, there that are a makes lot sense. of ways to be confused. This has me wondering about dev tools and things for for Orca, but maybe for for other things too. 
because it does seem like a, a space that's really easy to get wrong and where the results are very subtly wrong a lot of the time <laughs> where yeah. it's not really obvious to people that their color blending is sad until you point out like the red to green gradient example that you did well, and point out how muddy <laughs> it gets yeah i discovered some uh, like there are uh, some people that have um, uh, built like uh, special purpose built images that will blend incorrectly yeah i've got RGB one of those pulled up like, on screen right now so it's yeah or, that, or that's, both of them very, actually the dalai yeah. lama one and the your scaling software well as you put it <laughs> it abruptly tells you uh, yeah. the quality of your <laughs> software <laughs> So right now, it actually does not come through very well, the, the version of the image that's up there. It's supposed to say your scaling software sucks, and it kind of just looks like nonsense. Yeah, I um, think it, 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 it looks mo mostly nonsense. I never, I never had it really uh, clearly show you your uh, scaling software uh, sucks. But It does clearly do say it, rules. I, yeah. Um, so, uh, so you have things like that to, to double check yourself. Because like just looking at gradients and things like the um, like the differences are noticeable, but like if you if you are not if you don't know what to look for, you it's it's not like you have different kind of gradients and which is right, which is wrong. Yeah. You don't really know. And the 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 naming is confusing also because like um, sRGB gradients kind of look linear to our eyes. And linear gradients look non-linear. Non oh, sure, right, because of how our eyes' perception is different. Yeah, because so. our eyes is not is not linear. It's, uh, oh, it's man. Only, like, like same thing as our uh, ears. Like we perceive things in a logarithmic uh, right. way. So, yeah. Well, so what are you gonna do with this knowledge besides just the the make sure that the color models in Orca are correct? So I keep uh, I keep uh, saying that I will do a video on uh, like making a color picker for the Orca UI um, mm. library, and i have not uh, each time I have an, like another topic to uh, to explain in another video, but I will get to it. And also like uh, on the mid to longer term, uh, I would like to do like the right thing, which would be to get the um, the color profile of your monitor and embed like the color profile of uh, the, the, the colors you were working uh, with uh, when you created your application and do the color matching between those two mm. color spaces so that the if you are working on your Orca application and setting colors for your UI or uh, any visualization thing and you try to get very nice colors, then when you display it on another screen, um, it will look the, the the same or like as close as possible to the same color. Sure. Um, which which is not the case for a lot of software. Um, a lot of the time, like colors just depend on whatever color profile you have on your monitor, and if there is a mismatch. Yeah. Um, that would so genuinely would, be really like cool. I mean, I was that. just fighting some bugs with this in Chrome recently, where when yeah. I drag a window between my two monitors, it like gets dramatically dull on my like higher dynamic range monitor, even though I have HDR disabled. It's just like, nah, you're you're you have sad colors on this monitor. Yeah. <laughs> it's very <laughs> weird. Um Yeah, that would be really cool to do that in a proper way. And, and yeah. So that people can yeah just deliver the product that 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 they were working on and not seeing like all the color changing randomly. So. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity. We put you last for a reason, and it's so that I can go to an Orca promo. And uh, oh, yeah. So <laughs> nice. there's there's been a lot of cool stuff happening with Orca semi behind the scenes. So after the uh, wheel reinvention jam last year, where we got a bunch of feedback and, and you know, saw a bunch of people try and mostly fail <laughs> to use it because of tooling issues. There's been a yeah. ton of work that's gone into reworking the whole tooling situation. There's all new tooling that's written in C now, so no more Python compatibility issues, and we'll be able to dis distribute builds of the tooling to everybody. There's, um, well, you've been working on a web GPU port. That's come along yeah. really, really well. So we should have much better 
compatibility and fewer graphics API issues across different platforms because there were a lot of issues with GL drivers on Windows and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, GL was the, the, the worst offender. Yeah, and I was amazed by how many, it, so. how many awful problems there were with that. There's a whole new libc. Uh, Ruben Dunnington has done an yeah. incredible job of building out an entire Orca-specific libc implementation so that you can you know you no longer have to be constrained to the little libc shim that we shipped with you've actually got a a, a real libc available to you um all that stuff is oh oh and the other thing is that there's some uh odin support in process as well so ginger bill yeah. and skytrius in particular i believe have been working hard on getting all these new tooling things and new libraries integrated into orca so all that is, I mean, I won't, I won't put dates in your mouth, but it's coming soon. And I don't know if there's anything else you'd like yeah. to say about that work. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, everything landing. Uh, yeah, very soon. Um, the, the tooling is, is, is uh, here at least for all the user part. You won't have to deal with any like building or code base or anything. You just like download the tooling and. It will automatically download the SDK, and you can just uh, focus on your your application and use the tooling to bundle it into an Orca um, executable. Um, yeah, and the the libc is great. Um, I, I'm pretty excited about the Odin support, and they are doing like their own um, thing to make it like um, like more um, uh, idiomatic to Odin. So that's that's pretty cool. And I'm also pretty excited about the web GPU stuff, and mm -hmm. I've been working on it for like the, the last uh, three months. And and no, like we have like one uh, rendering backend, so yeah, a lot of the work can go can go quicker than just uh, before. We had like a metal backend, uh, an OpenGL backend. We have also to maintain like a G the GLES backend for 3D stuff. So. Uh, a next step is also to expose the web GPU uh, API to to apps so people can use web GPU to do 3D stuff in addition to the 2D vector uh, graphics rendering we have. So yeah, I think with all these things, uh, it, it will be like a much better experience and it enables us also to to then focus on on the next big topic, which is uh, debugging yes. and getting your really good graphical debugging uh, experience with uh, web, web assembly and i'm very excited to to start working on this uh really soon believe me i'm looking forward to it too i mean like yeah the debug situation for web assembly is such a mess that like i i practically think that there's <laughs> people might be willing to run their apps in orca just for debugging of otherwise non-graphical things because it's like such a mess to work with web assembly yeah. in in tooling stuff today so and i, I think am excited the, I mean, format itself makes makes a great opportunity for having like a lot of uh interesting debugging features because like it, it's pretty it's more uh self-contained simpler format yeah. than a lot of things we have so we might be able to do uh, interesting things uh with debugging uh at a, at a uh, lower cost than doing it in native and we can go from like interpreted to jitted to like there there are a lot of opportunities for uh, mm -hmm. getting a good like live coding debugging experience so it's super exciting <laughs> to me i am so excited to see where all that will go so go to orcaapp.dev and uh, asaf linked it in chat subscribe to the orca newsletter i expect one will probably be going out pretty soon judging by the state of, yeah. of tooling and stuff again no dates but hey it's it's come along pretty I well i have to sit down and write it yeah 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 <laughs> i was i was just trying to test it out this morning but it took too long to clone the angle repo at the coffee shop that i was at so I had to abandon that <laughs> that will yeah. also be smoothed over for the actual download but um it's it's real close by the looks of it and i'm very excited so thanks so much for joining us, yeah. Martin. Thanks so much for doing the jam. Thanks for organizing. Yeah. It was really cool. So we will, yep, see ya. We will wrap things up here. Uh, I'm going to go back to my Discord emergency overlay and we'll pull in uh, Colin and Asaf for the actual show here. Uh, I'm just going to hang them. 
so and i will i will do some jank on my end to uh hello hello let me i i have to um set up my webcam in a funny way here because it doesn't come through discord so <laughs> give me a second i have to like here is what we'll do we'll oh right i'm not in studio mode so you don't get to see me humorously click and drag <laughs> my camera to sit in place of my my avatar on discord there you go so yeah that's the learning jam how do you guys feel like it went that was really cool we had some awesome speakers this time yeah yeah i i was super super impressed i mean it's a weird format i know that like first of all it's weird to do a learning jam at all that the the purpose of it is just to to learn and share things it was compared to like papers we love like maybe that's kind of similar but uh it's still a weird format and then for it to be a two weekend thing um it's it's doubly weird and i'm glad that people seem to enjoy it um do you think we would do it again next year is there anything we would change i would love to do it again next year i i would like to participate next year Obviously yeah i have a less busy gem a uh, couple weekends but yeah. yeah no that was that was great i'll have to get uh community feedback on things that change i thought it went really well there was nothing that i yeah. saw that was obviously like wow this is a problem yeah if anything it was yeah. just like confusion around the discord <laughs> integration and projects and stuff which was just some some bugs and, and random things but i was really excited to see people sharing their today i learned updates uh throughout mm -hmm. the thing um i was really you know i i really have enjoyed looking through people's projects again and taking a look at their the things that they were learning along the way and how that mm -hmm. reflected in their their eventual write-ups or videos well that process is really cool too getting the like along the along the path learning uh conversation is really valuable for trying to figure out how they got there yeah and if people are not aware the til command exclamation mark til on discord still works and works in any channel and you can do it anytime you want and it'll go onto your handmade network profile if you have your profile link so keep that in mind you can do this any time of year learning jam or not if you learn an interesting fact that you think is worth kind of pinning as like wow this was a really cool thing run that command you know put it put it in a discord message share it with the rest of the community we are hoping to do some website updates later in the year redesigning the overall handmade network website so that it surfaces more of that sort of live information about what things are working on, taking the good parts of the showcase integration that we currently have, the project integration we have, and just doing more with it. I've been working with Jess Shuta, the Chuta. I don't even know. I, I can't tell if it's the way Abner says it or if it's the way, <laughs> or if that's how she says it. I need to clarify. Sorry, Jess. Um, but I've been working with her on some design prototypes. She's done an amazing job. She's also the one who made the amazing logo and overall design for this jam. So round of applause to, to Jess for putting that all together. It was an amazing, amazing help. And I'm so happy with the, the, all of the design work, but we've got some website updates in the works that I'm looking forward to starting work on. And let's see what other, what announcements do we have on our list? Two more jams this year. That? We are doing the visibility jam again and the wheel reinvention jam again. Dates to be announced, but uh, we are looking forward to running those again. We had a great time with them last year. Great turnout for both. See no reason to change it. <laughs> um, and the other thing, Colin, do you want to do the honors on the conferences? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We just got dates in from... Uh, Abner confirms for conferences. Let me pull those up. I put them somewhere. Uh oh. Yes, here we go. All right. So we've got Handmade Boston confirmed for August 9th through 10th, and Handmade Seattle uh, confirmed for November 20th through 22nd. So, yay. It means we can plan the rest of our calendar too. Which yes. Is super helpful. We've um, been waiting with bated breath for Abner to give us those final dates as he's been working out venues. We're very excited that Boston is happening again. Very excited that Seattle's happening again, obviously, but Boston was the new one and the, the more unknown one. And like, oh, it's so good. I'm really, really Sabin's looking forward to the it. Conference pages aren't quite up to date yet, but the newsletter should have details if you're subscribed to that. Yep. So keep an eye out. Yes. Go to um, um ah, Asaf is is still doing all the chat moderation. So uh yeah, go to go to handmadecities.com slash news, sign up to the newsletter, 
you'll get the specific dates and ticket info once Abner launches all that. But we're very glad to at least confirm to the rest of the community that that is happening, which is just so Yay. much fun. And then we've got regular on wine stuff. That's third Saturday of the month. Yep. Uh, there should be one coming up in April. I'm confirming with the speaker now, but I'm hoping that this one will be kind of kind of different than the one we brought uh, had had before. It'll be no, well, I won't spoil it, but I'll let you know when we get a little closer. It'll be exciting. Yeah. So unwind will continue. It will be on this Twitch channel. So make sure that you're subscribe or uh, following. Make sure that you're following. Uh, subscription is not currently possible, but we're working on that. <laughs> Uh, make sure that you're following so that you get notified when Unwind happens. And of course, uh, pay attention to the Discord events and that kind of thing. We notify everybody there too. And there's even more stuff that we have in the works for the Handmade community this year. We're still working on education. We're still working on some other financial things, I will say. And uh, I'm really looking forward to announcing more over the coming months. So thanks everybody for being here. Thanks, of course, to... Asaf and Colin for doing so much critical work to make this jam happen, just like they do every single time. Thank you to everybody who participated. I had a great time participating myself. I had a great time reading everybody's write-ups, learning from them. It went, for me, honestly, exactly how I hoped it would. I have learned so many interesting things and been prompted in so many topics by the work that everybody did for this jam. So really looking forward to doing it again. Really grateful to everybody who made it worthwhile to run. So with that, I think we're going to sign off. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And we'll see you in April for Unwind here. So goodbye. Yeah.